Hello again, and welcome to another exciting episode of Social Studies. And I, um, this is my third attempt at this one. I had some technical difficulties. I was trying to do it on my own home laptop, and for some reason it would not upload. So here we are. Some of you, it might be a little bit late. Some of you, you might be a little bit late or maybe it's just right. But here we go. We're going to be, um, this is an easy day. We are going to listen to a couple of stories from our bookcase in the back of the room here, the Story of Us books. Um, I believe we're on volume three now, A New Nation, it is called, and it has some interesting stories. We're going to read a few of them, and we're going to try to get through two of them quickly today, if I can do this rather quickly. The, this is about starting out the new nation and, of course, George Washington becoming the first president. So on the left side, we have the first page of the preface, Getting a Nation Started. And on the right, it's just zoomed in a little bit more. Um, if you don't like the sound of my voice and you want to read it, I will try to attach it in Cami as well. But here we are. Getting a Nation Started. In a preface, the author is supposed to tell you what is coming in the chapters ahead. If you don't like the sound of it, you can stop reading. Well, this preface is here to tell you to read on, and I am telling you to read on as well. For this is a good book, full of stories. It is about the beginning of our nation, of a nation, our nation, the United States of America. It wasn't easy getting the country started. Mistakes were made, some big mistakes, but mostly we did a good job. Maybe it was because we had remarkable political leaders. Here are some of the names. George Washington, Ale John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, James Monroe, John Marshall. We could go on, but we're not going to. No nation has had more impressive a more impressive group of founders. They had strong ideas and strong differences, but they're only part of the story. Imagine life in 1789. The United States has a just written, untried constitution. A new century is soon to begin. The 1800s. The, our young country has a, young, has a president instead of a king. And that is an idea that takes some getting used to. Remember, these people have always had kings. Never before have people written their own constitution. Never before have so many been able to vote. Never before has a nation offered its citizens complete religious liberty. Yeah, in 1789, those voting citizens were mostly white men who owned property. Why should that bother some people? That is the way it is, all, it is done in England. Besides, everyone knows that in the United States, ordinary people can and do own land. And that, and it's, that is astounding in this 18th century. It is the Constitution's words that are bothersome. The Constitution... The Constitution says, we the people. Just who are the people? Some Americans say that the people means all people of every color, race, and religion. Not everyone agrees. Cautious people believe that the government has already gone too far with this democracy nonsense. Others say it hasn't gone far enough. A few who are courageous and determined will work to bring freedom and fairness to all. The new constitution has a provision, an amendment process that allows it to be changed. Right away, there are demands for changes. Right away, 10 amendments are added. Those first 10 amendments are a bill of rights. We Americans don't want to take chances. We want to make sure that our freedoms are put down in words. The bill of rights gives us specific freedoms, such as freedom of religion, freedom of speech, and freedom of the press. But now, with the Bill of Rights in place, most citizens have other things on their minds. There is much to do with this newly formed nation. Ships keep bringing more and more people to America. Homes need to be built, forests cleared, and land explored. And there are questions to be answered. No one in these United States knows what the land west of the Mississippi River is like. How wide is it? Who lives there? What plants and animals grow in the region? Someone should find out. Why should anyone rush? Life on this land is slow moving. Farming methods are the same as they, were, as they have been for thousands of years. Most Americans get up at sunrise and go to bed soon after the sun sets. Only the rich have watches or clocks or can afford to burn candles. Too bad we can't warn people. They are in for some big surprises. 
as this 18th century turns into the 19th, an industrial revolution begun in Europe will find its way across the sea, and it will speed the pace of life. Optimistic and productive years are ahead for us. Things will go well for us Americans, except for something that is already giving our nation a terrible throbbing headache. This headache is caused by greed and heartlessness. Some Americans are taking advantage of other Americans. Some Americans are enslaving other Americans. Some Americans are upset about it. Others don't seem to care. Many white Americans seem to think this country came to this country as indentured servants. They had to work for someone else. They weren't free to leave or do what they wanted until their indenture was finished. Some were treated like slaves, so slavery doesn't seem unusual to them. Besides, slavery has been around throughout written history. The Bible talks of slavery. The Greek and Roman republics had slavery. Many European, African, and Asian countries allow slavery. People are used to slavery. Most people don't question things they are used to. They are wrong not to ask questions. Slavery is terrible. American slavery is racial. The slaves are people of color, African or Native American. Slavery is economic. Slaves represent money to their owners. It is very, very difficult for slaves to win their freedom. Nevertheless, some do become free. There is a growing population of free blacks. They have jobs as carpenters and blacksmiths, farmers, cooks, and stable workers. Some are prosperous, but most are not. But as the 19th century approaches, ideas are changing. European nations are beginning to outlaw slavery. One by one, the northern states outlaw slavery. According to the Northwest Ordinance, there is to be no slavery in the Western territories, although some will have it anyway. In the Southern United States, a way of life depends on slave labor. If, if slave owners free their slaves, they will be giving up their wealth. People, people never like to do that. Curing the headache won't be easy. There are no miracle pure pills around. Slavery is making some people in the North and South see things differently and hate each other and say so. The American experiment in self-government may fail if this problem of injustice is not solved. How can a nation built on this idea that all men are created equal keep some people in chains? It can't, of course. Our country will split apart. Spoiler. Um, before it is, before all its people understand that. This book is the story of America's good beginnings and the cruelty of slavery that will lead us to war. Okay, back to recording. Um, this is the next one, The Father of Our Country. This is chapter one. I'm only going to read the main gist of it, and you're going to read like the side things as we're scrolling. The Father of Our Country. This is more about the, the beginning of George Washington's presidency. So George Washington was 57, and he was home at Mount Vernon, the place he loved most. Before, when his country had asked, he had left the comforts of his Virginia estate for the harshness of war. Then he left again to, spore four, to spend four hot months in Philadelphia, where he was needed to see a constitution written. Now, um, all right, ignore the bells in the background. Now he was being asked to leave once more. It was April 14th, 1789, and Charles Thompson rode to Mount Vernon with a letter for George Washington. Thomas, Thomas, no, no Thompson, Thompson, I'm sorry, who was Irish-born, had been Secretary of the Continental Congress from its beginnings in 1774. The Congress was out of business. The new Constitution had changed things. The Confederation was finished. Now there was a Union of States and a new Congress for the United States. The letter that Thomas... Thompson, I don't know why I can't say that name today, the letter that Thompson carried told George Washington that he had been elected president of the union. He had been elected unanimously, which means everybody voted for him, and that was important. Although, as you know from a previous lesson, um, not really very many people actually voted in that first election. It was usually decided by state legislatures, and not every state participated. The Electoral College was unanimous, but that's another story. All right. It would not happen with any other president. It would have, it meant that the government could get started without fighting over a leader. The letter said Washington was expected in New York for his inauguration. The city was to be the capital until a new one could be built. Of course, Washington must have been proud. Martha, his wife, must have been proud of him, but he hated to leave her in Mount Vernon, especially in April. Cherry trees were in bloom, 
so are daffodils and tulips, and so too dogwood trees, whose white blossoms floated like a layer of lace in the midst of the green woods. Washington was a farmer. <clears throat> he was a plantation owner who owned people who did the farming for him. He was not out digging in the fields himself, most likely. In April, he was thinking about spring crops and all the chores <clears throat> that had to be done on his big plantation. Not by him, necessarily. But he did what his sense of duty told him to do, that what he felt was best for his country. He agreed to be president. Two days later, he wrote in his diary, about 10 o'clock, I bade farewell to Mount Vernon, to private life, and to domestic felicity, and with a mind oppressed with more anxious and painful sensations than I have words to express, set out for New York. It took eight days to make the 235-mile journey. It would have been faster, but in each town, citizens greeted their president-elect with a parade, or a bonfire, or fireworks, or speeches, or a ceremonial dinner, or a chorus, or sometimes all of those things. So many people lined up, lined the dirt roads, and their horses' hoofs raised so much dust that Washington <sighs> that Washington said he could hardly see the court si countryside through the dust cloud. Yet he was always gracious. Waving from his carriage, he saw many faces he remembered from the Revolutionary War battlefields of Valley Forge. As he approached Philadelphia, he got out of the carriage, mounted a white horse, and rode toward the city. The parade of horsemen that followed him grew longer and longer. At a bridge that spanned the Schuylkill River, in at Gray's Ferry, Washington, 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 sorry, couldn't help but be dazzled. A grove of laurel and cedar trees seemed to be growing out of the water. At each end of the grove, tall and leafy arches were covered with flags, ribbons, and flowers. It was the work of his friend and fellow soldier, the, init the inventive painter Charles Wilson Peel. Peel's 15-year-old daughter, Angelica, was riding in the artistic, art, uh, artistic shrubbery. As Washington passed under an arch, Angelica pulled a lever and a laurel wreath fell and rested upon the hero's head. Modestly, he rode on after kissing the girl. At Trenton, he crossed another bridge decorated in his honor, this one with patriotic banners. He remembered being in Trenton during the Revolutionary War with his half-frozen soldiers. Now, a chorus of women and girls sang and threw flowers in his path. Strew your hero's way with the flowers, they sang. He called it an affecting moment. That night, after yet another public dinner, he took time to write thank you a thank you letter to the women and girls. When he finally arrived in New York, rode across the Hudson from New Jersey on a barge decorated with streamers, Church bells rang, cannons roared, and people cheered until they were hoarse. After ever modest, Washington thanked the crowd and said, After this is over, I hope you will give yourselves no further trouble, as the affection of my fellow citizens is all the guard I want. Six days later, when they were still cheering, it was the day of his inauguration, April 30th, 1789, Washington wore a plain brown suit, made of American cloth. That was a big deal because the it, most cloth at that time was made in Britain. So wearing American-made cloth stood out on the balcony of Federal Hall overlooking Wall Street, bowed to the great crowd below, put his hand on his heart, and took the oath as president. Afterwards, he and members of Congress walked up Broadway to, to aspired stately St. Paul's Episcopal Church, which actually, by the way, is still standing in New York City. There, under a blue sky ceiling, the new president prayed for guidance for the young republic and for himself. Oh, come on, keep scrolling. Oh, that's it, the end. Okay, so the only question you're going to have um, to answer is what was the secret password for these videos? I'm not going to, it's an easy day. We're just going to have one question. The password is going to be inauguration. Inauguration means to be sworn in, taking the oath. Here you see George Washington taking the oath. He is being inaugurated. So inauguration is the password for the one and only question you will have to answer for this lesson. Thank you and have a pleasant day.